Hello, my name is Brian Powers and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress. And today is October 2nd, 2013, and I have the honor and privilege to speak with Lee Raines today about his time when he was in the military during World War II. Uh, Mr. Rain, thank you very much for doing this interview. You're entirely welcome. So we always like to start out with these interviews and get a little bit of an idea of where you were from. So our first question is always is, is, where were you born? I was born in Dayton, Kentucky. And I went to the grade school at Dayton. And then we moved to Bellevue. I went to high school at Bellevue, Kentucky. Now, the people who don't know where, where that is, where, where is that on the map, uh, Dayton and Bellevue, it's Kentucky? Dayton and Bellevue are on the Ohio River across the river from Cincinnati, Ohio. So when you, were, uh, when you were growing up, you grew up in this town that was on the river. What were some, uh, would you, were there were, weren't there some steamboats and things like that on the river? Yeah, well, we lived at 3rd and Berry Street which is gone now, the flood walls are where, that, how, what, where our house was, and <clears throat> the Harrison Boat Harbor, the Dayton Ferry was at the foot of Berry Street, and we were friends with the Harrisons, and we knew all the different people who had boats down there, and uh, it was a real, good experience at fine people. Uh, <clears throat> we knew all the steamboats, but went up and down the river, knew the Island Queen, the Island Maid. The Island Maid didn't run too long, but uh, I remember when the Queen was going up river, the Maid was coming down river, and they would pass. <clears throat> And uh, this was a long, long time ago. But, uh, it was it was a good time, and uh, <clears throat> had good neighbors. Everybody knew each other. Everybody helped each other whenever there was some kind of a, a thing that we were doing. People had gardens on the on the river bank in the summertime. It was it was really nice. Now, since you're so close to the Ohio River, weren't you uh, have flooding issues sometimes? What? Fl flooding issues? Would you have floods? Oh, yeah. 1937, we, our house was 3rd and Berry Street. Nothing but two inches of the chimney was sticking out of the water. <laughs> so do, what do you remember of that? Did you remember having to evacuate or, or no, We We got out of there. Uh, we weren't actually living in that house at the time. We were living on 4th Street between Vine and uh, Walnut Street in Dayton. And the water backed up the alley and it broke through. There was two big holes where they had mined gravel out of and the water busted through that, that whole area there about, <clears throat> oh, bigger than a football field on one side of the street and a smaller hole on the other side. And that whole area filled up in a matter of two minutes. Just really. And we were living on 4th Street and we had everything on the second floor, everything but the piano. And they moved the piano out <coughs> as the water was coming up. <laughs> we just got out of there in time. So how many people were living in, in your house? It was my dad and mother, my sister, my brother, and, and me. And you were probably about 12 or so around I that I was time. about 12, yeah. And where were you in line with your siblings? Are you oldest, youngest, or? I was the youngest. <clears throat> my brother was 10 years older than me. My sister was five years older than me. So uh, you were probably the one who had to carry the most stuff, huh? Yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, not really, but it was a it was a bad time, and we lived with friends of ours down at Bellevue, the Booth family. They they came up there right away, 
and we stored our furniture up in the top part of the house. Then on Black Sunday, there was, well, they had this gigantic barge and two big outboards on it, and a bunch of men, and my dad, my brother, they went out to our house and took the windows out and unloaded all the furniture onto the barge. Then, God, we had furniture everywhere. <laughs> it was in the church, in, the, in my uncle's business down in Bellevue. He, Uncle John was a chain link distributor, and his business was on Union Street, for the old Wigan Ice Company. That uh, we had our furniture scattered all over. <laughs> But it was it was quite a time, so and I was able to when the weather was was better when the rain let up. I would be, walk all the way up through to Dayton to to see just where the water went, and in Dayton on Main Street, which which run in front of Spears Hospital. <coughs> It went all the way to 7th Street in Dayton, and you couldn't get you couldn't get through that. It wasn't wasn't allowed. You know, it was too deep for a car to go through, and uh, that was as far up as it went. Now that's a long, long way from the river. That uh, so Dayton you, was really hit hard. Yeah. Uh, well. How long was it before you could get back into your house? It was a, God, I guess about three weeks. But as, as, the, as the water went down, then it turned off real cold. And <clears throat> my dad and a bunch of men were going through different houses, cleaning them up, and getting them so people could move back in. And somehow he got down into the basement and started a fire in the, in the uh, uh, furnace and it warmed up the floors <coughs> and they shoveled ice and snow about that thick. I mean ice and mud. And there we had a gigantic pile of, of <laughs> mud outside of our, our um, dining room door, it was a mess. But, but one thing about cleaning up after a flood, you will scrub and scrub and scrub and scrub. And it takes years to get rid of all that flood mud in the, in the floorboard. Yeah. But uh, we, <clears throat> we finally got it cleaned up good and repainted and papered and this and that and the other, everything made it nice and livable again. But it was it was a mess for a, a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, what kind of work did your father do? He was the ice man. He was he worked for uh, t t John S. Wiegand uh, Ice Company, which my uncle John bought out later, and t turned it into his business. And and he he was also the Shaneling beer distributor for Northern Kentucky. Oh, not cool. So did you guys got some free beer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so were you you were in high school at Bellevue? Did you have to take jobs? Did you work when you were in high school? Or were you able just to go to school? I <clears throat> did. I work at a job. Yeah. Did you have like a paper out or anything? No, kind of thing? I did. Uh, uh, right before, the year before I went into service, I was parking cars over to Terminal Garage at 3rd and Walnut Street after school and then Saturdays and, and uh, <clears throat> sometime on Sundays. Then after I quit school, right, right before I went into service, I worked full time there at, at the Terminal Garage. But uh, other than that, I didn't do much. I had a, I think I had a, a Liberty magazine route for a little while when I was a kid. 
What's a Liberty route? Yeah. What What is that? It was a magazine. And you had different customers throughout the city. You delivered the magazine to them and collected the money. But what, what, what kind of magazine was it? Uh, it was a... I'm not exactly sure how to how to say this, but it was a magazine of, of love stories and stuff like that for yeah. women liked it. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're in high school, uh, Pearl Harbor gets attacked. I, yeah, I was. Do you remember when that day when you heard the news? I can remember exactly where I was, and and we were <clears throat> we were kids, and. On Sunday, <coughs> on Sunday, we would go to Fort Thomas to the roller rink, and we, a friend of mine, Cecil Phillips, and I were, went out there together, and he comes skating to me. I was up in the front part talking to somebody, and he said, we have been bombed at Pearl Harbor. And I looked at him and I said, where the heck is Pearl Harbor? Nobody knew. <laughs> then it all broke that evening and we rode home on the streetcar and uh, just couldn't believe it, you know. And that, there was guys, the Nevins twins were both paper boys and they were up and down Fairfield Avenue in Bellevue, screaming extra all night long. They sold a lot of papers. Yeah. And it was just a terrible time. And nobody knew exactly what we were going to do or anything, you know. It was all in the news and the papers uh, started probably, trickling in. You were probably about 16 at that time. Yeah, I think I was. Did you, did you figure at some point you would, you would probably be getting into the I, military? Or? I never, never thought too much about it. Most of the guys older than me were going in the Air Force and going into the different branches. Yeah, of the service. In, in Bellevue, were there a lot of people joining up? Oh, yeah. yeah. Bellevue had a lot, a lot of guys in the service. And uh, who took their... Who took their uh, place back home? Uh, I guess the, did, you know, I'm assuming they had jobs. I guess uh, they had women uh, doing those jobs, like in Yeah, Bellevue. there was a lot of different things changed, and a lot of people went to work who never worked before in their life, and ladies, and and uh, it was quite a change for the whole country. Yeah, that uh, we. The American people took a hold right away, and they were united closely, and everybody had the same thing. Everybody had something to do with the, the service, or some branch that, that helped the service or whatever, but somebody, everybody had something to do, and it, it was... Uh, a good time as far as bringing all the people together. Right. Um, so, I guess we get to the end of '43, and then you, you get something in the mail, I guess, from the government. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, <clears throat> we were drafted, and we went to uh, Newport to get on the. To report in, and it was Eastern Standard Time, and then there was Eastern War Time, and I had the two mixed up, so I come an hour late, and the high school was there, the band was there, and everything, and I missed it, and Mr. Wright wrote me a, a, a letter. He was our principal at the high school, and the day before. Before this happened, I rang the fire bell at school. <laughs> it shagged out of there. And his note to me was, 
Dear Lee, sorry that we missed you. I wish you could have been here, but for one thing I want you to know, I know who rang the fire bell. <laughs> George Wright. <laughs> that was funny. And, uh, today that would have been really bad. He said, however, the, however, it was the best fire drill we ever had. <laughs> So, where did you go next? Uh, or where did you go first, I should say? Or after, well, after we processed out of Fort Thomas, we were shipped on on a train, made up a train and there at the, <clears throat> in Newport. And then we were shipped from there all the way down to, to Florida to Camp Landing, which is a very big, big camp, and there's a gigantic lake there, and uh, we had 17 weeks of the most rigorous training that they could give you. And we came out of there at camp landing on a uh, four, uh, 10 day delaying route to Port George G. Meade, Maryland, and we went after my 10 days, I went up to Fort George G. Meade, Maryland, <coughs> and uh, we were processed again and loaded on a train. And then we had backed out of Fort George G. Meade, Maryland, to about where Laurel Park Racetrack was. And there were th three officers and one non-com come down through the cars reading off names and mine was one of them and we were told to get our equipment and get off the train on the right hand side form a column of two and walk, walk back to where we came from so we did that and when we got back to the parade ground where we left from someone met us there a non-com and he told us all to go back to the billet to the buildings that we were in. So I went back there and reported in. I was the only guy. And me and this sergeant was that run that, that company there. He says, well, I'll go find out what happened. He goes to regimental headquarters and he comes back and he says, all I can tell you is they pulled all the 18 year olds off of the shipment. And from then on, I lived there with him, and I painted everything that didn't walk. I built sidewalks, and I did this and that and the other. And then we eventually start getting guys in from overseas. And these guys were buck sergeant, staff sergeant, master sergeant, and I'm in charge, and I'm a buck private. You'd think they didn't have a good time with me. <laughs> But we got a lot done, though. And it, it was a, a fun and interesting time. Yeah. And from there, <clears throat> later on, after about four weeks, uh, they made up another shipment. <clears throat> and we were, all these 18-year-olds were sent down to uh, Camp Butner, North Carolina, to restock the 89th Division. And the 89th was an experimental division, and uh, they carried everything on on their backs mostly. They had one one truck and one jeep for the each battalion, and it, everything else was on push carts with guys pulling them. It uh, it was a heck of a good heck of a time from all the stories I've heard. And one one friend of mine, he's he's passed now. Huey Taylor is one of the staff sergeant. He said the 89th maneuvers was a hell of a lot rougher than combat was. Really? <laughs> he says he says only we didn't we didn't kill each other at that. But he said what what we went through was horrible. Yeah. You know. And it must have been. 
But anyway, I was very proud to wind up in a, an outfit that I would go overseas with a unit instead of going as a replacement. A lot of times replacements were put in, into a company, nobody knew their name, but, and they got killed right away. Right. They didn't know, didn't know what happened to them. But it was bad. It was a bad time, <coughs> and we uh, we fought a lot. And well, when did you when did you go over? Uh, well, we went overseas. Uh, let's see. We got there in January of um, 1945. Mm-hmm. And we went into action, I think January, February, March, we went into action, March, and that was the tail end of the Battle of the Bulge. Right. And we went up through uh, um, I can't think of the name of it, but it's a little, it's a little city up there. Anyway. Was it in Germany? And we went, we cleaned up the battle of, of the, of the, the uh, Moselle Valley. We cleaned that all out. And then we went from there to the, the Rhine River, and we we crossed there, right near Lorelei Rock, and <coughs> the grapevines grew up and down the the um, hillsides. And it was so steep, you had to pull yourself up the, on the grapevines to get up the hills. And unfortunately, one of the men in our outfit lit a haystack and set the whole damn valley on up, uh, lit the whole valley up, and in come the artillery. So we had a <laughs> tremendous amount of artillery. But we went up to the top of the hill and then we had to wait there <coughs> while uh, they built the bridges and everything and got the majority of the equipment across. <coughs> and then we moved out. And uh, <coughs> there was B-17 that went down right on the top of the hill there. And before he, before he crashed, he unloaded his bombs. And luckily, there was a couple bomb craters <laughs> there. <laughs> Saved my life. As they said, there was a 20 millimeter um, machine gun firing all across this whole thing where we were coming in, and uh, I hit that <coughs> that uh, crater, and Lieutenant Wetrick hit it right in behind me, and he was directing fire for the 81 millimeter mortars. And he gave him the proper coordinates, and fired the first the first shot. Hit right on the barrel of that thing. He was about you know, maybe 300 yards away. It was a perfect shot. I'll never forget that. But he he was good. He was a good um, director. You know, and come to. Was that your closest call in, in combat? Then, or no, we 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 went on. But right for what happened before that, you wore your canteen on your back, and I was laying out in this this uh, plowed field, and the machine gun fire was so low that it hit my canteen and shot that off off my back and shot a hole in that thing that big around. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I'd had it for sure. But uh, we went on. Well, how were you? How were you? Uh, how did you end up in that field? Where you just walk along, someone starts shooting, and you hit duck, oh, duck yeah, on the yeah. ground. Oh yeah, yeah. There was a, a whole company of men out there, there. and uh, hey, uh, <clears throat> we lost uh, Moritz and David. Two or three others, about five altogether. We lost that day. Oh yeah. <clears throat> and, it, and being in the infantry, you never know 
when it's going to be your turn. Because hey, they pop up from nowhere. Yeah. And you, you're going to, if you don't get them first, they're going to get you, that's for sure. Were you going through little villages and stuff? Yeah, we take those t villages and towns, we clean them out. Were you taking prisoners? Were you? Yeah, we take out? a lot of prisoners, and, and they'd have to march them back to the rear, and the MPs would take over from there. And they'd take them, take them on back. Did you? I mean, obviously, you're you're still getting a lot of getting shot at and stuff so they were still but uh i was getting kind of within the near the end because yeah we were when we when we crossed the rhine we were spearheading for the third army and 89th and the fourth armored division were running side by side or together mm -hmm. and uh, we went all the way up to uh, 90 miles from Berlin, but before we got there, we took uh, Ordruf, which was the first concentration camp that the Americans ever saw. And what a horrible mess that was. So I'll you... never forget it as long as I live. There was thousands of, of bodies that they were, they were dead or, or half dead. And the smell was horrible. And General Patton and General Eisenhower and all the big shots were there, came up to the front to see what the hell went on. And uh, they insisted on all the troops in that area that could see the, that concentration camp. If you didn't know what you were fighting for then, you sure as hell did then. As that was, that's what they did. But were you... Really, I guess you were, must have been completely shocked by all that because, I mean, how aware were you about what was going on in the con concentration camp? I had no idea. So when you were approaching that or, or you know, arriving, what were you thinking? Was this a prison camp or something? Yeah, we just we didn't think much about it. <coughs> but this, our company didn't take it. C Company in 354 took that order, and the rest of us came in later. But uh, it was a horrible, horrible sight. I got pictures of that, I'll show you. And but uh, we went all the way up to 90 miles from Berlin. We, we went about in, in miles, that would have been about from where we took off from Atlanta to here. Okay. Yeah, and most of that was on foot. <laughs> lots, How much, lots and lots you, of. I guess you were on the move every day. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> That's a lot of ground to cover yeah. in that time. Yeah. yeah, we we were, 89th was, was a crack outfit. They really were. They knew how to get things done, and they'd been. The, their most of their non-coms and officers that were, were kept were damn good. They were. They knew their business, and then so did the rest of us. We were all well trained. So I was glad I was there, but I wouldn't want to do it again. <laughs> yeah. So you were there when uh, you probably heard Hitler committed suicide. Yeah. How did you get yeah. that news? Uh, that was that came over our uh, radios. <clears throat> he said he was going to do something on his birthday, and our gas masks were probably a hundred miles behind us. <laughs> we didn't carry them, so they everybody figured we was going to get gas. And he shot himself and shot Eva Braun. <clears throat> and uh, that took care of that. That uh, that was one horrible person that. Adolf Hitler. I. I don't guess there'll, there'll ever be another one like him. I hope not. Anyway. Right. So, the Russians were the ones who were, who were allowed to go in the Berlin. That was the deal. I yeah, think. that was the biggest mistake ever made at Yalta. That agreement. All of. See. <clears throat> we took that 
a lot of that area that was designated for the Russians. We took that, went all the way up to 90 miles <coughs> from Berlin. And uh, it was, uh, it was just a, a bad mistake. And Patton put us, when we got up to the, what they called the halt line, <coughs> Patton put us into the the Seventh um, Army, and he took the Fourth Armored and went ac across all the way to Austria, and went up through Austria for liberating that. And he was a great horseman, and he wanted to liberate the Royal Lipizzan horses, and he did. <coughs> he he said he figured they were going to kill them all and eat them, you know. Right, yeah. Did uh, did you ever see him at all when you were over there? I saw Patton on the front two or three times, about three times. He was a true warrior. He knew what the hell he was doing. And he <coughs> was not a diplomat. And he would do it. And he was issue an order and expect it to be done right then and there. And when you heard him talk, you knew damn well you better do it. And <laughs> most people liked him and that fought for him. But the, there were some who did not like him. Right. And I, <clears throat> I was proud to be in, in his outfit. Well, I was wondering, since you were so close to Berlin, and uh, I guess that's where you were uh, when Hitler died, and, you know, it's... Yeah, we were, in, <coughs> we were in a, a little farmer village called Petrosgruen, and we, that was the last battle we, we fought. <coughs> we had a big... T um, Mounted gun. It was a like a like a tank. Only it had his big gun mounted on it, and they they were firing at us with that thing. <clears throat> Anyhow, they kept retreating and getting out of this little town there, and we set up right on the edge of the backside of the edge of the town. There was a barn here and a house here and a barn here. And we had two mortar guns set up in there. And there was a tank out here and a tank over there and troops all over the place. <clears throat> and a lot of things happened there that, that morning. Uh, we fired 30, 32 rounds the ammunition, that was a lot to shoot at one time. <laughs> we, we, we were, we broke up a counterattack with the 60 mortars. There was two of us firing. <clears throat> and uh, a lot of rifle fire. And this Motorized, I forget what they call that big gun. It was, <clears throat> we hit two rounds right on top of it and killed everybody on it. And it's still running by itself. <laughs> and went out through, through uh, woods and it got tangled up and stood there and oh, really? chugging it. <laughs> <him. laughs> uh, were, anyway. you, were you like... Um, under under a hill or something. Where was your position? Like, what were you? Like, I was how just, were you? I was second gun. Second, I was a loader. The French was my my first gunner. He kept the bubbles level and kept it right on the aiming stake, and I would load them and throw it down through the mortar that way. And we had a method. Tramiatola was our uh, um, squad leader and then uh, 
there was Kaplan and Ray, and, and they were ammo bearers in, in our squad. Well, there's three section of mortar squad. One mortar got run over by a tank and mashed the hell out of it. They couldn't use it, of course. And uh, the other one was way over on the other side. And we were on the side where <clears throat> we did most of the firing. And it was uh, it was quite a quite a day there. And my section sergeant was up on top of the barn relaying the message back down to the gun. <clears throat> and it was so noisy. My God, it was noisy there. <laughs> Myers evidently yells and sees firing, and I didn't hear him. And I'm still firing, and he comes down off of the, the barn, and he's hanging on the daggone gutters. <laughs> he turned loose. He hit the ground. I guess he, he must come down about 10 feet. <laughs> And he knocked me upside down. <laughs> and when he's kneeling on me, just chewing me up one side and down the other. <laughs> he says, you little idiot, I told you to cease firing. <laughs> uh, anyhow, we, we, had, we, had a, we had a lot of, lot of firing going on that day. But that was our last battle. And we sat there for two weeks. Then he moved us back to another little village, and we stayed there about a week. And the next thing we know, we were sh shipped clear, clear on back to a railhead, and loaded on cars, and shipped us all the way back to France. And we run the cigarette camps, right? Lucky Strike, Chesterfield, Old Gold, uh, Pall Mall. 20 grand, and we wound up at Camp 20 grand, and uh, we were in that redeployment camp for, oh God, I, I, I guess until uh, October, no, yeah, about October, yeah. November, and uh, <clears throat> the low pointers had to go back up into Germany, and I was still a low pointer, <coughs> so I went all the way back up into Germany to Degendorf was right on the Moselle River. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, we joined the 83rd Division. And the, this lieutenant, he's in front of all of us guys. He said, I need truck drivers and I need Jeep drivers. Nobody volunteered. <laughs> And he says, I told you guys, now I'm not kidding, I need truck drivers and I need Jeep drivers. I put up my hand. I wound up driving a two and a half. And it was really interesting because I went everywhere with it. Wow. I made one trip 2,600 miles all the way down to Marseille, France. <laughs> <coughs> and it was... It was interesting. Were you transporting supplies? And, uh -huh. like, were you transporting supplies? Oh, uh, what it was, me and the sergeant from C Company had to go to uh, I can't think of the name of the city in in Austria and pick up the 26 divisions history books. They were printed there. And we had a great big box, it's about four by four by three and a half. It's full of history books. And that was our load. We had to take them from Salzburg, Salzburg, Austria, all the way down to Marseille, France. And that was 2,600 miles one way. And that was an interesting trip. Um, I was, was interesting to know if you ever uh, Run into Russian soldiers. I had to deal once with Russian soldiers. Yeah, well, I'll tell you about that. We met them up on the the halt line. Right. That's why I figured maybe it is. And we waited for two weeks for for them to for those Russians. Well, 
here they come across the field. They put a great big open space out there. They got a horse and a cow pulling an artillery piece. They got their women with them. They're a drunker and a bear, every one of them. And we looked at them and I told this buddy of mine, I says, we're supposed to be afraid of them. <laughs> they, were, they were a horrible army that we saw, you know. But anyway, <clears throat> we got that all done. <clears throat> and then, then we were in the process of moving back. So you were over, you stayed in Europe, uh, I mean the war ends in Europe in, uh, in you know, April of 45. Yeah, right. And, but you were over there for almost another year. Almost, yeah. Yeah, I was, so I was in... what were uh, some of the things that you were doing uh, <coughs> as an occupying army, I after, guess? After I was stationed at uh, Gauls Park, Austria, the um, service company at the trucking company <coughs> for I don't know I'd say about eight nine months mm -hmm. and then we moved from there to uh, Salzburg Austria and went up out of <coughs> Salzburg <coughs> about uh, ten miles to another little village up there, and I've forgotten the name of it. And we had a coal pile to, to guard. <laughs> That's all there was. It was just like living easy. We didn't have any, any big strain or nothing going on. Well, that's good after your, uh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and we have one thing that was, was really good there. <coughs> they took a bunch of us in a truck, took us to this uh, other village, which wasn't too far away. <clears throat> and a guy by the name of Tony Benedito was, a, he was the top performer mm -hmm. for the, the, what they call that now, the 42nd, 42nd Review, that's okay. what it was. And uh, 42nd Division was, was headed up by General Hollywood Harry Collins. And they had a beautiful um, opera house there. And they put on this show. And hey, Tony Bennett was damn good. Wow, yeah. He, he, was, he was the same age as me. And. Uh, <coughs> I never did get a chance to meet him, but I really liked him. I thought he did a good job, and it was it was something else. So, um, did you get to see much of Europe? I mean, travel around, you get to see much of uh, the cities or anything? Yeah, I saw quite a few big cities. And, uh, <clears throat> like I say, I had several long trips and that one real long trip. But uh, <coughs> I went up through, uh, what the heck is it? Went to Prague one time with a load of displaced persons. We had about, had way too many in the truck, but they were, they were glad to ride anywhere they could. I took them back, we had about six trucks in a convoy. And then uh, we went down through the Brenner Pass to Italy and uh, took some more displaced personnel back that way. And then we were in the Red Cross restaurant on the main square there in Brenner, Italy. And these two Two Italians snuck a can off of my truck, and I'm watching them. So as soon as they took off, I took off after them. And they cut into this alley, and I was right behind them. It was about 
40 yards away and I snapped a bolt back on that 45 and I said, halt. Man, they slammed on the brakes right now. <laughs> I made them carry it all the way back there and strap it back on my truck and opened it. I said, stick your finger in there. So I grabbed this one guy's hand and shoved it in. <laughs> it was water. They thought they had gasoline. <laughs> so, uh, when did you get out? You got out in... I got out in uh, May of 1946. Yeah, I guess you, you it shipped you back by boat? Yeah, we came back by boat. We moved, we uh, <coughs> shipped out of Bremerhaven, <coughs> Germany. And this um, boat we was on was one of the fastest of the uh, Liberton, was that a Liberton? No, it, anyhow, it was one of the ships that there was a lot of them. And this guy was going to set a new record from Bremerhaven to New York. Well, we got going out, hadn't been under, <laughs> underway for more than two hours, and we run into the darndest fog you ever saw. You couldn't see nothing. And we, we're, we had to drop anchor, and there's whistles blowing, and there's other ships are trying to move, and we laid there for 11 hours and something, some kind of minutes, I forget what it was, anyhow, before the, the fog broke and we went on. Yeah, he's, he's still going to make a run for it. <laughs> so, about three days later, the main boiler went. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> instead of making a record, we were probably three, day, three days longer getting home. <laughs> uh, shoot. But uh, getting home was something else. And you, you come in to New York Harbor, and it was just breaking daylight. And you could see the silhouette of the Statue of Liberty. And all the boats come by and they're blowing for you, blowing welcome whistle. And uh, it's just something you never forget. Yeah. So when you got back to, uh, to Bellevue, did you have a big uh, welcoming party for you? Uh, yeah, my mom had, had everybody at the house we lived on Mesh Court, which was right behind the Bellevue Commercial Bank at Taylor and Fairfield. This little dead end street there. And it was it was great. Saw everybody and, and uh, <clears throat> Bill Freedy was one of the guys that we knew and he started the Bellevue Veterans Club. And he wanted to be sure that and I would join the Veterans Club as soon as I got home. So I did, and it was a good thing. And uh, Bill Freedy, the first, the, the, let's see, the, the first annual banquet that the Bellevue Veterans had. The tables were set in a horseshoe fa fashion. Bill Freedy's up here with all the officers. And there's 558 guys. He called out each and every one of them by first name and second name and some with their nicknames. He never missed a one all the way through there. And I thought that is the most remarkable recall I have ever seen in my life. Wow. And I don't think I've ever seen anything like it since then. But he he was just fantastic. He never had a, never had any paperwork with him or anything. <laughs> uh, he was great. He became electrical engineer. Oh. I'm sure he, he was a good one. No, I, I know in Bellevue there's a there's a, a veteran thing right on the kind of the main drag is is that where yeah that 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 was built about 
geez, I don't know what year it was built, but it, it, it belongs to Bellevue Veterans. So what did you uh, end up doing for a job and career after, after you got out of the service? Well, <clears throat> after I got out of the service, <clears throat> Jack Pierce, he and I were friends, and his, his wife was a friend of ours, like family. And uh, I came home, Jack was the was first one to say, well, I could, anytime when you want to go to work, I got a job for you. So he was working for King Records then. Uh, he had worked in the record business with the Columbia Records, he and Al Miller. Al became the <coughs> the uh, um, like a sales guy, at King. sales manager for King. Well, we'll we'll get more detail about King in another interview. Yeah. But what you ended up working at King, and what was the the job? What kind of things were you doing at King Records in what Cincinnati? I, what I was doing <coughs> was loading and unloading trucks, moving stuff around for shipping and receiving, and that was my bag. Me and, me and one other guy, uh, I can't think of Danny's last name, but anyhow, just the two of us. <coughs> At the, that was about it, I guess. And then eventually you became a traffic manager? Yeah, I, when Jack Pierce went, they sent him to California, to uh, uh, Los Angeles. And he was open a uh, distributorship out there, and he and Hazel. Uh, I don't think they had any kids yet at that, at that time. And uh, then when he left, uh, Al Miller appointed me to to run the uh, shipping and receiving. Them. I got a title as traffic manager. <laughs> So how long did you work at King? I worked there from uh, September, I mean, yeah, September of 1946 until 1950. Yeah, it was the latter part of 50. And, and what did you do uh, after was, you left King? I run the shipping and receiving department, and I did that for a couple of years, and then I went out on the road selling. And I went to Washington, D.C. was my first territory. And uh, <clears throat> I covered Washington and part of Virginia and part of West Virginia and a part of uh, Maryland. This was my territory there. And it was interesting. And so I should ask, at some point you, get, you did get married, right? I didn't get married until I was 26 years old when Joanne was, she was 19, I think. So that would have been... That was in 1952. Okay. So that's when you stopped being on the road, huh? Yeah. Decided to try to get a job where you're staying in one place. Yeah. <laughs> so, and where was that? I, uh, I tried insurance. I didn't like that. After I left King, <clears throat> I, I don't know what all I did. I see. Yeah, I worked for Frank Ort Roofing and Sheet Metal down on Old Third Street. And Art, Art Owens, he was another friend of mine, he hired me. And then I worked with him for about a year. And then I, uh, he didn't have enough work to keep me on in the winter time. <clears throat> and then I got a job driving a dry cleaner wagon for Bud, uh, Doug Munster in Bellevue. And I took care of Bellevue, Dayton, and Newport, and Fort Thomas. That was interesting. And, uh, my brother kept telling me, you got to have a trade. And he had been working in the machine tool industry for a Eastern Machinery um, Company over in, where the heck, 
on California Avenue out there somewhere. Mm. Anyhow, then I I finally put in an application at RK LeBlanc, and I didn't have any mechanical experience except I worked on race boats and I worked on a couple of crews on hydroplane racing. And that's that's my my hobby, and. Uh, <coughs> This guy, Mr. King, out at R.K. LeBlanc, said, we're going to take a chance with you. And they hired me to work in uh, Department 6, where we built the lathes from 14-inch up to 13-inch um, race heads. Great big lathes. And small lathes, but all kinds. Anyhow, I worked for R.K. LeBlanc for almost four years and my brother kept pushing at me to go to use to um, GE I didn't really care that much about going out there but I was working ten and a half hours every day at RK LeBlanc and a half day on Saturday <coughs> and then uh, I went to GE Jesus, I had a hard time there the first couple of days, first couple of weeks further. Uh, I just could not stay in that place. <laughs> they didn't know what the hell they were doing, mm -hmm. and they didn't. <laughs> anyway, they had a different method, and I soon adapted to it, and then I did good work, and I was always particular about taking care of machinery and equipment, make sure everything was right on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I worked as a machinist, machine repairman for how many years? 10 years, I guess. And then, <clears throat> then I went, took a foreman job and running the machinery and equipment. And I had about eleven million dollars worth of machinery and equipment and I was in charge of and take care of. And it was interesting. And I did that until <coughs> let's see I worked <coughs> from uh, yeah. After about 12 years of working in machinery and equipment, I took a job in production. And I thought, how can these guys have so damn many problems and they're making the same widget every day? Well, I found out, hey, the least little thing goes wrong with your, your product in the production line, you got a problem. You got a big problem if you don't get it stopped in time. And I uh, did re real well with them, <coughs> and uh, eventually I got a managerial award for doing the, a good job there in, in production. How, how long did you end up working in, for GE? I was there 32 years. So you retired from them? I retired from there. Uh -huh. and. Uh, <clears throat> Let's see, it was uh, February the 1st, 1986, when I retired. Well, great. Well, I just have uh, just one or two more questions because we're about to run out of time on this. Um, I was wondering, have you ever been back to Europe since you were uh, in the no. service? Never been back, huh? Never been back. Don't think I ever will. I'm. I'm almost 88 years old. <laughs> yeah. Did you find that any of your military uh, experience helped you with your jobs later on? I mean, we, no, not really. No. <clears throat> it, uh, no, I can't say that it did. So when you when you think back uh, on your military service in that time, what are your what are your feelings about all that? Did you, was well, it? my feelings were, I was glad to be there, 
but I wouldn't want to go back to do it again. <laughs> and uh, I, I worked hard, and I was recognized as as a good soldier, and I, uh, <laughs> when we were at Camp 20 Grand after the war was over and all, all that, I was a PFC and I'm running a big area to do all the <coughs> process these guys coming home. Everybody else was a sergeant or better. Oh, we, we'll take care of you. We're, <laughs> Don't you worry about it. You're going to get a sergeant's stripe or this and that. I never did get it. <laughs> anyway, I didn't care because I had a, had a good job. You weren't going to make a career out of it, I yeah. guess. <laughs> <coughs> well, anyways, I wanted to say thank you very much for, for doing this interview and, and tell us some of your memories about your time. So thank you very much, Mr. Thank Ryan. you.